Um, welcome to our special Ukraine briefing. We're honored to welcome three all-stars tonight. <clears throat> Fiona Hill is joining Big Tent for the first time. She needs no introduction to all of you who will remember her as a cool and impressive witness in the first impeachment hearings of the former president. She's a senior fellow in the Center on the United States and Europe at the Brookings Institution and former National Intelligence Officer for Russia and Eurasia at the National Security Council and is one of our leading experts on Russia and Putin. The first 130 of you who signed up for tonight have received or will receive a copy of her book. We'll put a link to purchase a copy in the chat for everyone else. It's a very engaging book. Jim Himes is Big Ten's favorite member of Congress, representing those of us who live in Connecticut's fourth district. He's joining us for the umpteenth time tonight. We actually tried to count how many times he's been here with us and couldn't do it. And Norm Eisen, whom we consider our in-house pro bono democracy expert and now moderator is here for his fifth visit, I think. His last visit was in his role as co-chair of States United Democracy Center. This is sort of a mini reunion of the 2019 impeachment. Jim is a member of the House Intelligence Committee, Fiona, as I said, as a witness, and Norm is special counsel to the House Judiciary Committee. It's sad that we have to bring them back together to discuss the devastating attack on Ukraine, but we are so very lucky that they're willing to share their perspectives with us. Before we get started, I'd like to let you know about our next two events. On Wednesday, March 16th at 7 p.m., we'll hear from Daniel Squadron, co-founder and executive director of Future Now. Future Now focuses on state legislatures where we are seeing a lot of activity to undermine democracy here in the United States. And on April 5th at noon, we will host Me Vicino, the fastest growing voting rights organization in Florida. Please join us to learn about their work. Okay, Norm will moderate tonight's conversation. Please put your questions in the chat and he will get to as many as he can. Go ahead, Norm. Thank you, Sue. Thanks so much for having me back. Um, I've got a pretty impressive collection of big tent swag by this point in my career as your pro bono advisor. And uh, I wanna thank everyone at the big tent uh, for turning out in such incredible numbers on such short notice, especially, of course, Susan Lehman and Vanessa Thomas for all of their work behind the scenes to organize this convening to respond to the crisis in Ukraine. It is an honor to work with all of you on these and so many other crucial issues facing our country and, uh, as we'll discuss tonight, the world. Um, uh, so delighted to be here to moderate with two preeminent experts and friends. Uh, 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 we have uh, relationships that uh, go far beyond just impeachment. Uh, my Brookings colleague, Dr. Hill, and my friend, Representative Himes, we're very grateful to them for making time in their uh, busy schedules in busy at the best of times. And this tragedy of the Russian invasion has really put both of their lives and schedules into overdrive. So we thank them for their willingness to come and talk to us about the horrific situation in Ukraine and the global response. And of course, to every single one of the hundreds of you uh, for tuning in for the conversation and uh, ways to help. We'll come to that at the very end. Um, you sent in brilliant questions. Uh, Fiona and I, in our, wearing our Brookings hat, uh, way through these questions. We were on a long call of colleagues across Washington and the world this morning, and she was amazed by the quality, and the caliber, and, and the technical nature of some of these questions. So we're going to try to get through. They framed uh, our moderation. Um, we'll uh, on behalf of all of you, I'll ask um, uh, a series of questions and then um, uh, we'll open it up, taking questions from every different source as they arise. 
Let me start by asking both of our guests for their assessment as of now, 6.41 p.m. Uh, Eastern uh, tonight, because uh, things are constantly changing uh, in uh, the war and in the invasion by Russia. Um, what's your assessment of, of where we are? And uh, do you think Mr. Putin is surprised by what he has encountered in Ukraine and around the world. Fiona, I'll start with you. Well, thanks very much. It's really great to be with everyone. I'm honored to um, make my foray into the big tent. So thank you very much uh, for having me. Um, and as for Mr. Putin, I think, you know, first of all, we have to say that we're not really sure exactly what kind of information he's getting from what's happening on the ground in Ukraine. And I'm sure Jim will have, you know, some thoughts about, you know, this as well, particularly, you know, when you're sitting there on the intelligence committee, because, I mean, we all know how these briefings and things work, you know, information is filtered up. And, you know, one of the kind of questions is, you know, what kind of um, eyes on the ground does, does Russia have beyond, you know, the obvious of, you know, satellites and, you know, the, uh, the people who are there on the ground? You know, do they fully understand uh, the uh, the zone uh, in which they're operating? And, you know, it's the rest of it is what do they really understand about what's happening in the response here uh, in the United States, as well as more broadly in Europe and elsewhere uh, around the world? We can be pretty sure that um, Putin is discounting and the people around him are pretty much discounting anything that's being shown in the international media uh, as propaganda. And so, you know, basically the kinds of things that you and I and everybody else are looking at. I mean, I spent some time doom scrolling on my phone before we got onto this um, as he's looking at things from Twitter, you know, or broadly on the internet, a whole range of um, other media sources. I'm getting endless amounts of emails and um, WhatsApps from friends and, and colleagues, including people who are on the ground in uh, Ukraine right now. And we can be sure that in the all source information that Putin's getting, it isn't as rich as some of the information that we're getting. So first of all, I just want to say that we're not really sure how he thinks things are going on the ground. But he's been telling people like President Macron of France and others that he thinks things are going to according to plan, and that cannot be the case. Basically, I think Putin thought that he was going to be able to move into Ukraine, that the government would be toppled fairly quickly, that um, any kind of resistance would disappear uh, fairly in, in short order. I mean, we know some of this because there has been the leaking, and again, we always have to be very careful about propaganda, of course, but the leaking of um, what appears to be some kind of speech that Putin thought that he would be making on the 26th of February, just a couple of days after the invasion, explaining to the Russian population about what had happened and why um, they'd gone into Ukraine. They've described this as a technical, a military technical operation. It's now illegal to talk about it as a war in kind of Russia. There's massive censorship. There's a clampdown. There's repression. There's the arrests of people who are protesting. And there's an effort to put an iron dome of, of sorts around Russia in terms of information coming in. And clearly from the reports that we are getting from on the ground that we're getting, um, all of us out here, that the Russian military hasn't made as much headway as it thought it would in the northern part of Ukraine for sure, perhaps a little bit differently in the south around Kherson, Mikhailov, and uh, the areas outside of uh, Crimea and around the Sea of Azov. And there is no way that the Russians um, in, in any way anticipated uh, not just the response of uh, the US Congress, but the response of companies, uh, European countries and their governments and ordinary people around Europe to uh, this invasion. Uh, there are things that I don't think even in our wildest dream, as many people have been implementing sanctions for years or thinking about sanctions uh, against Russia uh, would have occurred, including the pullout of BP, uh, ExxonMobil, you know, major oil companies, the you know, vacillation and debates that are going on and, and others. And something, um, and, and um, you know, you and I were on the same discussion about this norm earlier today with um, former Swedish Prime Minister Carl Bildt, even talking about IKEA, which may seem very trivial to many people here in the big tent, uh, uh, but is an extraordinary symbolic, but also practical withdrawal from uh, the Russian market. IKEA was one of the first companies to move in uh, into Russia. 
And um, as Prime Minister Bilt told us, 15,000 employees uh, in Russia from IKEA who are also finding their jobs disappearing overnight. So there's been an enormous blow to the Russian economy and to ordinary Russians as a result of this conflict that I can't say that Putin would have envisaged. Jim, what's your assessment of the state of play uh, in the conflict from your perch in uh, in Congress and from talking? You just were on a call uh, with President Zelensky over the weekend. How does it look to you? Yeah, thank you, Norman. A big thank you to uh, Big Tent for bringing us together. Um, uh, the last time the three of us were together was a much more formal uh, moment with Norm providing invaluable advice to the Intelligence Committee and, of course, Fiona as a witness. Uh, we prepared pretty hard for all of our witnesses. We didn't prepare as hard as we did for Fiona uh, because we knew what was coming. And, of course, she resisted uh, all attempts on the part of both Republicans and Democrats to gain partisan advantage, and that made her testimony, of course, that more important. Uh, and by the way, I start there not just to be um, diplomatic and political, but because one of the things we need to remind ourselves of is the mind frame that Putin had going into this. Um, I don't need to go over the way President Trump talked about Putin. Uh, he's used words like savvy, genius. And of course, we all watch what happened over four years where he chose to believe his in, uh, uh, what Putin told him rather than the work of his $80 billion a year intelligence community with respect to things like Russian's activities. And remember, we all came together to impeach the president for the act of withholding military aid to President Zelensky in exchange for, in the famous words of the perfect call, um, but do me a favor though. And that of course involved um, uh, his, his, his political hopes. Um, so I say all that because one might imagine, and, and, and it's a really important question to which I will always defer to Fiona on, but what is Putin's mindset right now? He went into this 10 days ago with every reason to believe that this would be a short campaign, that the United States would be divided, that Republicans would repeat their um, sort of now four-year-old um, uh, attacks on Ukraine and, of course, tacit uh, support at, at, at worst of, of Putin. Uh, and of course, drawing on the lessons that he might have drawn on with respect to how he was treated with his invasions of Georgia and his activities in Chechnya, and more recently, um, activities in, um, in, in Crimea, the taking of Crimea, and of course, in, in, in the eastern provinces, it is far from irrational for him to believe that he would roll his military into Ukraine, Ukraine would give up very quickly, um, and that the West would be divided and, and silent, because quite frankly, to some lesser or greater extent, that's the way the West responded to a lot of those things that I just listed. So um, uh, do we know that he miscalculated? In some sense, we do, because our military people know what a uh, configuration, a military configuration looks like if it is anticipated that there will be very stiff resistance. And it is most certainly not trucks and armor running out of uh, gas uh, 20 miles outside of, um, outside of uh, Kyiv, which is the current situation. Um, and so uh, it is pretty clear to us that, uh, that Putin made a massive miscalculation. It is frightening to us that we are in a position now where the West is united beyond our wildest dreams. Uh, I never, I was at the Munich Security Conference and I heard the new German chancellor say, well, Nord Stream 2, we might, I don't know, we might cancel it. And under no circumstances are we providing weapons to a European conflict because we don't do that in Germany. You know, 36 hours into the conflict, both of those things, Nord Stream 2 was done and the Germans were providing weapons to uh, the Ukrainians. Switzerland, centuries of neutrality, no longer neutral. I mean, the list goes on and on and on of things that are shocking to us and therefore quite certainly shocking to Putin. Norm, what really worries me, and this is, this is where I think there's a lot, to, a lot to talk about, Putin has gotten himself into a position where there's just no graceful out. Um, it's very hard to imagine that for the next couple of weeks, he doesn't just continue to double down, continue to uptick the savagery. That seems to be his playbook. And that is going to lead to just brutal scenes, far worse probably than what we're seeing come out in this last 10 days or so. Um, and increasing pressure for the West to even ratchet up those, you know, to find ways to stop the purchase of, uh, of Russian energy. Um, but it's a very dangerous moment because this has obviously gone in a radically different way than President Putin would have uh, would have imagined.
I want to come back to this question because it's such an important one of the um, the off ramp and not backing Putin into a corner and um, uh, not leaving a nuclear powered um, superpower with nuclear weapons with with uh, no options. But let me ask you, Jim, something was so striking in what you said, the distance that really the Europeans have traveled between the Munich Security Conference just a few weeks ago, where Germany was not willing to uh, suspend uh, Nord Stream 2, to uh, the startling um, uh, posture. The whole time I was ambassador, I talked about the need for Germany to do 2% of GDP in NATO spending. And Fiona, whatever differences with you had with Donald Trump, that was a theme of his. He didn't know quite how to express it. I know it's, uh, I know it's something you worked on in the White House. How do you explain that 72 hours between the Friday after the invasion, when the Europeans were not, were even resisting the SWIFT sanctions, the banking communication, to the Monday morning? What happened, particularly on the economic war, if I may call it that? Fiona, what, 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 what uh, flipped the switch for Europe? Well, I think it's really very interesting. And, you know, obviously with uh, Jim having all these discussions at the Munich uh, Security uh, Conference, I think a lot of it is the reality of the situation really sinking in. And Jim, I mean, I don't know in some of the discussions that you might have had there on the margins, um, you know, kind of the, the impressions, you know, that you got from people about how they were assessing the intelligence. But I did a lot of um, Zoom uh, calls with uh, European policy planners, you know, so with government officials, and they were extraordinarily sceptical about our assessment of the intelligence, uh, particularly the French. Um, and, um, you know, part of that is to do with, you know, way that we've handled intelligence in the distant past. I mean, you will recall, remember, everyone will remember that the French uh, were very much opposed to the US decision to go into Iraq in um, 2003 and were extraordinarily critical about the, you know, the, the way that we obviously mishandled and misread intelligence there. They believed that, you know, we had come up with a pretext of our own. And so there was an awful lot of speculation in, in other circles that we were hyping this up but yes, they could see the same things on satellites. They were getting their own intelligence, but they didn't believe that the intent was there. I mean, I, you know, I had so much pushback from people that I was talking to was saying, no, he wouldn't go for a full invasion. Why would he? It was their rationale for this. I mean, there may be, you know, push on Donetsk and Luhansk and even, um, you know, the Donbass, the, the, the two uh, uh, breakaway uh, regions, especially when um, Putin moved to recognize the independence of Donetsk and Luhansk. This was kind of the fullest extent of what people were anticipating. And then they were proven wrong. And the United States intelligence and that big risk and gamble that the administration took and everybody else of sharing that intelligence with them and going out and giving them their assessments, it was actually proven you know, to be uh, not just a gamble but or, or a risk, but it was actually right there, the, coming into fruition, everything that had been said. And I think there was this kind of shock there that, that they hadn't been taking this seriously enough and that they actually really needed to do something. And then there's the realization sinking in that we had been under uh, basically reacting at best back in 2014, when there was the annexation of Crimea, the war in the Donbass, and that basically, you know, thinking about that whole idea of World War One, we'd been, World War One, we'd been sleepwalking into this kind of situation and that Europeans had been in denial. And, you know, many analysts had been in denial as well about saying, no, he absolutely wouldn't. And so I think we've had- What did then, you think, Fiona? A reaction. What I was, was in your mind? Well, I would just say that a few weeks ago, I was hoping that he wouldn't do this, but I'd always said all along that if he felt that he had to go for a full force invasion, that he would. But I was hoping that he would re recalculate because he had an awful lot of options on the table. But I will just have to say that my colleagues, my old colleagues in the National Intelligence Council were talking to me saying, look, he's made the decision, he's going to go. I always hoped that there would be something, look, again, he has made the decision, Vladimir Putin, right? I kept hoping that maybe something would make him recalculate and make him do something else. There's always that possibility. 
But basically, many of our counterparts in Europe were, were not even there. They didn't think that he had that on the table, that this was just an elaborate bluff and they kept telling us this. And so I think the shock of that and then the recognition that they'd underreacted on so many things along the way, this is what kind of pushed them into doing so much more because uh, just a very quick vignette for everyone here. And Jim, you'll remember this as well. After the brazen um, attack on Sergei Skripal, the former Russian spy and his daughter Yulia in Salisbury in England, in which, you know, a British woman was killed by the Novichok, the uh, weapons grade nerve agent. We were trying to push um, our European countermarks to take really strong action. And yes, they did expel in, um, uh, intelligence operatives, but not in large numbers. It was only the US that really tried to go for mass expulsions and the Brits who tried to wrap up that entire um, network there. And we kept saying to our counterparts, look, they've got this hit, these hit squads running all the way over Europe. We've got to take some real action to show them that we mean business. And although that we did surprise the Russians, it was not strong enough. And I think getting back to what Jim said, the Russians took away from this that, you know, we were pretty weak, but we could be really pushed around here. And I think the Europeans realized that, you know, that finally that that point was getting through. But I mean, Jim, you had conversations with them, you know, behind the scenes, I'm sure at Munich. Were you getting the same idea that they weren't really believing the intelligence that they were that was being shared with them? I, I think you're exactly right, Fiona. Uh, and yes, that was the tenor of the of the conversations. Um, but let me let me match your vignette with one. I um, I know something's going wrong in the world when the BBC calls my cell phone at, at midnight for their morning show. Um, they've got my number, and so I get that call. And in fact, I'd gotten a call um, two weeks ago, a couple nights in a row, to be to talk about this because, of course, the United States was releasing intelligence, very specific intelligence about what we thought Putin's plans were. And, that, and there's a whole conversation to be had about that. But, but um, on with the BBC, and this is at a point in time when there's 130,000 Russian troops basically surrounding Ukraine. And the world knows, and, and I probably knew a little bit more in virtue of my seat on the Intelligence Committee, but the world knows and can see that, that, that this is likely not a bluff. There's things you can do to bluff. And then there's things that you do when, you don't, when you're not bluffing, like moving trucks full of blood um, you know, forward um, that are expensive and difficult to do. And you really only do them if you're not bluffing. And so the world saw that, but nonetheless, twice when I talked to the BBC, when I expected to be talking about what it was gonna look like, I was met with questions about, well, people say that this is just American um, exaggeration, that once right. again, your intelligence is faulty and you're hysterical about it. I, just, I sort of couldn't believe it because again, this wasn't, I, I probably did have some information about what, 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 uh, what was going on, but this was there for the world to see. And so Fiona's exactly right. There was just a deeply ingrained skepticism right up until the Thursday when, uh, when the borders were, were penetrated on the part of most Europeans. I've come to the big tent before to talk about the tragic lessons of history, including the lesson of 1938, when the world refused to see. And once in this snap to economic war, at least to economic war, as well as funneling weapons into Ukraine, by the Biden administration has really led the globe and left room for the Europeans. They didn't insist on the SWIFT, the banking, uh, communications expulsion. They let the Europeans come to that. But I want to focus on uh, on something else uh, Fiona said on the strength of the response, because the Ukrainians are not satisfied. And Jim, I know you heard this from President Zelensky. The Ukrainians want much more. Uh, uh, I was on a call uh, uh, today with Ukrainian civil society, and they say, why won't America and the West put a no-fly zone over Ukraine? Jim, what's your reaction? Yeah, you know, I spent the weekend with my constituents at rally after rally, and, and, and I understand how my constituents in Fairfield County, Connecticut, because they see this, you know, trampling of all that we think is good and right um, by, by an evil force. Um, you understand the emotions, but at some point you need to make a fairly cool calculated decision around how far up the escalation ladder you want to go with a major nuclear power, which is acting in ways that are, that suggest that it's a little bit of a cornered beast 
Um, and when you don't really know the mindset of the guy in charge, and there's this whole debate about, you know, has president has, has Putin lost it? What, my point is that what a lot of people don't understand, just to give you a technical answer to your question, we're used to thinking of no-fly zones the way we thought of them in Iraq, where there really was no opposition to our power in the skies, or even Afghanistan, there was no opposition. Um, we will not put pilots in the air until we have removed the threats to those pilots. And anti-aircraft military assets, um, people are used to seeing the shoulder-fired assets, but understand that anti-aircraft military assets are, are capable of striking at ranges of many hundreds of miles very, very effectively. And so the very first thing we would do to impose a no-fly zone around Ukraine would be to use some combination of cruise missiles, bombers, and other assets to kill Russians, not just in Ukraine and in Belarus, but to kill Russians on Russian soil, um, thousands of them. Um, and so now you have the United States plausibly being um, uh, characterized as the aggressor, and that raises two really frightening things. Number one, most frightening, is you've now massively escalated. And by the way, Biden has been clear that this will not happen. So not only have you massively escalated, but you've massively escalated against what you asserted was true right up until that moment. Um, and you've done that in the face of, you know, the Russians' ability and possibly willingness to use nuclear weapons. The other thing that is quite serious, as we've been sort of patting ourselves on the back for the last 15 minutes about the remarkable unity of the West, Remember that uh, expansion to this conflict gets fought in Poland and Germany and, you know, God help us in France, but it gets fought across Europe. So the notion that our NATO allies are going to say that's fine, kill thousands of Russians in Russia, I think is, um, is very, very unlikely. Fiona, the, uh, the response of civil Ukrainian uh, government and civil society to that is fine. You, you, you you're, they, they have various objections. They say, tell the Poles, the Slovaks and the Romanians who still have MiGs, we know how to fly them, to give us their MiGs. What's taking so long? Uh, what's your reaction to the backup plan that Ukraine has asked for of fine, just give us the Soviet era planes that the NATO allies have, we'll fly them. Well, look, first of all, I just want to kind of say just very clearly here that I am not a military expert. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm pr on pretty shaky ground on this one. So, I mean, maybe, you know, Jim's had some briefings on this on Capitol Hill as well. I'm not quite sure about the state and condition of those MiGs. Um, I don't know whether they have had um, new um, uh, packages put in to make them NATO compatible, which might make it actually quite difficult uh, for some of uh, the Ukrainian pilots to fly them. There's also the question of air bases and um, also if the Russians start to target those. And, you know, the, the question is, you know, how to get the Ukrainian pilots there to get them back, where they're going to be, how they're going to be fueled and maintained and everything. And Jim, I'm sure that you've had some um, briefings on this um, as well. Whenever we come up with a solution, there's always some logistical complications to have to address as well, which doesn't mean to say they can't be addressed. But you have to kind of think about these in the totality of then what will you do? You know, what's the next kind of backup plan? You know, in earlier periods in the uh, the conflict um, that Ukraine has been having with Russia, which goes back now to 2014, in terms of the annexation of uh, Crimea and the war beginning in the Donbass. Remember, we did have the shooting down of MH17, uh, the Malaysian Airlines by a buk, I mean, a, basically a Russian um, anti-aircraft missile that was handed over to the proxy forces. We've already seen, you know, what some of the things that can look like. We've had to um, basically close all of these corridors for civil aviation as we you know, had to do you know, back in 2014 in the aftermath of this. When there was also talk then about sending more weaponry and you needed to have a larger plan. So it's not just so simple as kind of throwing a lot of armaments, planes, you know, you name it. You have to have a full scale plan of what you're going to do in every eventuality. So I think we can talk about all of this, but we have to kind of then be very clear about how we're gonna do it, how things are gonna be maintained, you know, what the pilot, uh, you know, uh, capacity is for Ukraine, etc. But Jim, I mean, I'm and sure you've had some briefings about this as well, because I mean, obviously, your constituents are being asked about this. And I'm sure members of Congress are asking as well. Uh, all I would add to that, Norm, is um, uh, we have lots of tools 
at our disposal, which are valuable and fall well short of the the riskiness of a no-fly zone. Um, I, Fiona's exactly right about the mix. By the way, we are the Congress where I'm sitting right now is pushing very, very hard. Um, the, the issue is we need to replace Polish uh, MIGs with F-16s. That, that is something that takes a little bit of time to work through the process. But the sentiment in this place is that it should happen as rapidly as possible. But that's also important, but not, and that is certainly what President Zelensky stressed with us on the call over the weekend. Um, but we shouldn't also forget the incredible value of the weaponry that has already gotten there. You probably saw a report that there are as many as 17,000 um, anti-tank, anti-armor weapons in the country. There's not 17,000 uh, armored units uh, in the country, Russian armored units. So um, the ability to use those, the stingers, and by the way, there's a whole other side of the story on stingers too. Uh, the United States government is pretty careful about stingers because if they leak out and find their ways in the wrong hands, and turn up at the end of a runway in Astoria, Queens, we have a major problem. So this stuff, I say that just to say two things. Number one, um, there's a lot of very valuable military capability moving very rapidly into the country. Uh, and number two, there's always, there's, always a, there's always another side. Fiona's exactly right. A MIG is a very complicated instrument. It requires a lot of people, a lot of support, a lot of maintenance. It can be relatively easily shot down. So we shouldn't forget the value of everything else, including, by the way, intelligence sharing that is moving into Ukraine. I will say that as a foreign policy professional, one of the absolute hardest things is to see people suffering and dying yep. and to have to contend with the yep. incredibly, uh, the incredible complexity of what you can and cannot do to help, and the risk that you might actually make things work worse. Fiona, I'm going to come to you with a question about that. Then we're going to talk about exit strategies. Then we're going to open it up to questions from our group before our 7:30 uh, end time. Um, you um, made headlines in your Politico interview, Fiona by warning that Putin's nuclear threat was not just posturing and saber rattling. How serious are the threats that Vladimir Putin has issued about nuclear capacity and tacitly retaliation? Well, first of all, he does like posturing and saber rattling, just to be very clear. So those things are not you know, mutually exclusive in any way. And we've seen him do this in rather spectacular fashion. You know, a few years ago when he announced that they've developed these novel nuclear weapons, hypersonic uh, missiles, for example, and he did a kind of simulated demonstration during one of his annual addresses where it looked like he was bombing Florida. And, you know, that got lots of people's attention. So he likes to show off. And I've heard him, you know, in uh, meetings with uh, former President Trump showing off about the missiles and saying we got them first. So there's that. Somehow kind of I suspect Putin was not the only show off in those meetings, Fiona. He was not, but he was making the point that he'd got these novel nuclear weapons first. But then, so the other point of this is hypersonics. He, exactly. So he's threatened all the way along. Uh, and we've seen them exercise this. Jim and his colleagues will have been briefed about this, that they you know, obviously practice using battlefield nuclear weapons um, in uh, the, some of the exercises that they've had. They have nuclear capable um, intermediate uh, missiles, intermediate range missiles, Iskanders in Kaliningrad. We've seen them you know, use some of these conventionally armed missiles already you know, for demonstration effect and obviously for lethal effect. And what Putin um, has done by um, going on alert, obviously, is move us up uh, what seems to be the escalation ladder. We, I think we've uh, responded a bit in exactly the right way we should. Getting back to what Jim said about being cool and calm, and you know, basically not engaging in this, because part of the reason of this is to put that option on the table to get everyone to inspect it, to get us all to freak out, frankly, and to panic, and then to start trying to negotiate away Ukraine. And, and it's also because. It underscores Russia's conventional weakness, which we're also seeing to some degree now, and its inability to fight back on the economic front if there is indeed a full scale economic war, as you articulated it. And the feeling that if Putin feels cornered, that the only recourse that they will have to, is to go for the ultimate weapon. So what I wanted to do in actually putting that out there was just to kind of uh, explain to people that when Putin has an instrument, he wants to figure out how he could use it for demonstration effect, but also for what we've called escalate to de-escalate. 
if he thinks in fact that we're very serious about some of the things that we've talked about here and that we are going to intervene in a way that tips the battlefield even further away from him he wants to kind of find out how we can have the ultimate shock to the system in a way that is contained in somewhere because look, what we what we see with putin is is a kind of a calculation here he is not a complete madman um he may be emotional and very visceral right now but he wants to calculate what where something that he can do with the kind of least cost to himself so unfortunately he's trying to figure out right now is there some way of doing this he's already seized so this is another part of the nuclear arsenal chernobyl and the zaporizhia nuclear plant he's made accusations that the ukrainians were seeking a nuclear weapon of some description which is absolute bs but he wants to put um basically ukraine in the same frame as iran and as north korea as a kind of a rogue state and again getting people to pile on so what we have to do with this is to treat it very seriously to figure out how we're going to address it to appeal to other nuclear powers because basically what uh what basically Putin is trying to do here is to basically escalate this into a, in a, in a contained way for himself and to kind of manipulate us into again surrendering and capitulating. So we have to be very adept at our diplomacy here and to be making sure that we fully understand what he's trying to do. This is where Jim and his colleagues all come in, but be able to kind of push back, you know, behind the scenes as well to make sure that Putin knows that this is unacceptable. Jim, I'm going to come to you now on that diplomacy point. Is there a diplomatic exit? Is there an off ramp? Is there anything that can um, that can bring us to some kind of closure on this conflict? What might, whether it's in uh, weeks, months, or years, what might the contours of a diplomatic resolution look like in your view? Then I'll come to you with the same question, Fiona, Jim. Yeah, Norm, it's a it's a it's an in, immensely difficult problem to think about um, because um, you know it's one of the principles of negotiation that you're negotiating a partner across the table should have some way to walk away from the table, saving face or with something to show for it, um, and in this situation that's almost impossible because of the because of just the outrageous action that he has taken. I mean. Let's call a spade a spade here. Vladimir Putin is a war criminal, <laughs> and you know the an, un, uh, an unprovoked attack on on civilian populations is is a war crime. And that's not even to say of the you know ununiformed uh, Russians have been running around. I mean, you could just make a long list of war crimes here. It's not a it's not a coincidence, of course, that the International Criminal Court is 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 contemplating an investigation. And set that aside. Um, think about the global context here, right? Um, one of the things that's, that's interesting about this moment is that this is the flashpoint between the free democratic world um, and the other world, which includes um, any number of countries who believe that rulers are unaccountable um, and that they are not to be questioned. So of course, I mean China, of course, I mean Iran and North Korea, that's what's at stake. And so between the fact that he has now put himself in the position of being a war criminal and that we can't send a message to China that this sort of behavior will result in even incremental improvement in your situation makes a diplomatic outcome almost impossible to uh, envisage. Um, and, and so it's just really hard. I'm not a diplomat, but it's really hard to imagine an outcome that isn't um, Putin being defeated, either militarily, which is unlikely, but over time by the fact that his country cannot sustain a grinding occupation of 40 million people, none of whom like him. So it's just, I'm not sure that I can answer your question because he cannot come out of this having achieved even the most minor incremental improvement in his status. Fiona? Yeah, I mean, Jim has pretty much uh, summed it up in the problem here, because for us to be able to begin a negotiation, there has to be, you know, something that he can also uh, spin as a win, which is going to be very hard um, against the backdrop of all of the economic consequences uh, that have unfolded over 
you know, the last couple of days in particular. I mean, the ruble, you know, when uh, we were on a call earlier on, Norm, one of our colleagues pointed out that the ruble had gone down 45% in like 45 minutes. Uh, you know, so this is going to have knocking effects and the economic pain has not been felt yet. And now that um, many uh, companies have moved out of Russia, maybe IKEA will go back in, but we've already started in motion a kind of a process that has been getting pushed for years of uh, getting uh, Germany and many other European countries to start to diversify away from Russian gas, for example, and for energy companies to divest themselves and other companies to pull out of a market, you know, based on many other concerns that we've had for years about uh, dark Russian money and you know their influence operations. So there's kinds of things that have started to happen now that will accelerate and will not be reversible. And just as Jim is saying too, you know, even that the now what seems to be the floor of demands that the Russians have, which is guarantees of Ukraine not being in NATO, uh, um, basically um, the recognition of everyone of Crimea, the recognition of the independence of Donetsk and Luhansk and possibly even their annexation into Russia, those have become unacceptable uh, given uh, what has happened in Ukraine itself. And as Jim says, war crimes being committed all kinds of cases uh, already being uh, prepared, it makes it very difficult to think of a, a kind of a minimal starting point. And, you know, Russia's minimal starting point is already very difficult. Their maximalist uh, starting point that they've already put out in the months leading up to this um, as, as it was already, um, you know, pretty tough to contemplate without the war being in process. However, we have to find a way of stopping this conflict. So we have to find some opening gambits uh, we, we may as well, you know, start to proceed on some of the things that have been thrown out there, um, as unlikely as they may actually be. But we're going to have to find a way that Putin doesn't think that this ends with him being shot in a drainage ditch, as it did with um, Muhammad Gaddafi, for example, because Putin is paranoid about that outcome. So we have to be very careful about how we talk about it. And we're going to have to be trying to find as best we can some initially face saving um framing even if that's not where we we end up and we have to have somewhere that we can turn things back on the economic front as well so i mean i know that the administration has been thinking about this very carefully obviously in congress they have to think about this as well but it is already evident that we're not going to go back to um some of the place that we were before in the energy uh, domain and in many of the other economic and banking uh, areas as well the um the art of diplomacy is uh, like nuclear planning. Uh, sometimes the art of um, thinking about the impossible. And exactly. so with, with uh, Dennis, I've, I've put in the chat a piece uh, that I did with Ambassador Dennis Ross addressing how where you might go from here and those face-saving measures. Fiona, it's funny because right. you and I were on the opposite side of dueling letters last summer about how far to go in negotiating uh, with uh, a, a, a new reset with Russia. But I well, think it was never we, a reset. It was the importance thing of keeping up through channels for negotiation, yes, and now, which, we've got, which we've got to do now, too, because if we cut everything we off, we have to do it. We have no way. And that was what we were worried about. Some of us who were you know, signed on to that letter because we were worried that those those channels were moving away and that might have been part of why Putin also thought because it was our communications had broken down that it was he could he could go for this you know I do yeah, worry about won't. that yeah I I think it's important for us to that's why I'm so heartened by these um three rounds as unsatisfactory as they are and the continued engagement the engagement right. of the Israelis uh, Macron's continued engagement. We've got to keep that going, as offensive as it is to the Ukrainians. Yeah. Um, brilliant uh, survey uh, of the situation by our two guests. And now I want to move to the equally brilliant questions. Uh, the first of which is uh, on the topic of China, the other, uh, the big brother in the Chinese uh, Russian relationship. What are the lessons that China is taking away for, and I'm going to uh, ask you because we have literally hundreds of questions. So just we each of these could be a book. What are the lessons China is taking away? Is it 
casts its beady eye upon Taiwan from this economic warfare and the other things that have gone on? And what can be done to press China to cause a resolution here? Jim? Quick yeah, answer, can, easy question. I can do it quickly, Norm. Um, you know, three weeks ago in this building, we were spending a lot of time worried about a military attack on, on China. One of the very, very few silver linings here is that the Chinese have seen the world unite <laughs> to deliver an absolutely devastating economic blow to Russia. And I think in Beijing, they are rethinking their plans. And remember, remember, look, Russia's relatively unconnected to the global economy. They sell a huge amount of energy into Europe, and that's about it. China, of course, is, you know, pretty much everyone's major trading partner. And so not only is the specter of what happened to Russia sobering for them, but it would be, you know, orders of magnitude more devastating to their economy if they were isolated. And Jim meant they were worrying about a Chinese attack on Taiwan several weeks ago. Fiona, what about applying in this sanctions war, uh, uh, this economic assault, what about starting to apply some pressure on China? Would that be wise? Well, I would think more persuasive power behind the scenes with China, because I mean, I think we could plausibly make a case here that the reverberations from this for the global economy could be negative for China. Now, I mean, China may be saying, well, this is great. We might be able to pick up at a discount here, Russian oil and gas. But, you know, it's the it's the secondary effects of sanctions that may have reverberations. And also it may be that, you know, consumers in Europe and elsewhere look at China and the support of Russia and think, I don't want to buy Chinese products. I mean, you know, looking at the bottom of everything, you know, was this made in China? Was this made in China? Actually, yes. You know, yes, maybe everything. Maybe, you know, even more this the, Zoom is owned by China. Uh, exactly. But the, you know, program. we already had this during the pandemic of worrying about, you know, of all of our supplies. And this may be even more of a spur to start to think about, you know, revitalizing our own, you know, production. We've already started to move in this direction. And as people feel revulsed and think that China's facilitating this in some way. So there is, you know, this kind of opportunity for us to talk quietly to the Chinese behind the scenes and just say, look, this isn't going to play out well on, on a global scale. You are also the major investor in Ukraine. You've pressed all the time for independent sovereignty and territorial integrity. You know, uh, uh, also the non-proliferation regime is at risk here because, you know, what's now to stop Korea, Japan and others to wanting to seek nuclear weapons? Because, I mean, Russia is basically also signaling with its nuclear sabre rattling that only those powers that have uh, a nuclear weapon at their disposal can really kind of uh, press their interests or fend off, you know, some kind of assault. So, you know, basically playing out to China behind the scenes, look, you know, basically work with us here to stop this slaughter, reminding China of the rape of Nanjing, you know, things that have happened to them in the past. I would go for persuasion, you know, kind of, uh, and diplomacy, you know, rather than, you know, perhaps forcing them because of course we see with China, just like Russia, the doubling down when they feel that they're being cornered as well. Uh, Always dangerous to recommend when you're with Norm Eisen and op-ed, not by Norm Eisen, but I do commend <laughs> the group. Um, Tom Friedman, I believe yesterday in the New York Times makes a very interesting argument that yes, energy is important to China, but you know what is responsible for the rise of China over 50 years, of course, is a predictable, stable, rules-based world order. They may cheat on those rules, but that predictable rules-based world order is the story of China's rise. And it's just out the window now with what Russia's done. Um, um... A lot of questions, and I'll 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 top you, brother Jim. Uh, Tom Friedman has a very good uh, article, basically laying out the options for resolution. An op-ed that preceded that, the options for resolution. Uh, you know, they all stink, um, but that is where you live as a diplomat. He lands in a similar place. Um, as Dennis and I did in the one in the chat. A lot of questions about the Russian oil. Jim, if I'm a good reader of Congress, I'm pretty sure there's gonna be a bicameral bill once Pelosi says she's for it. That's, uh, that's about it. Bicameral uh, legislation to stop American purchase uh, of Russian oil. But the big 
The big energy enchilada are the European purchases of Russian oil and gas. Fiona, if uh, the Europeans extend sanctions um, to cut off the flow of European cash into Russia and oil and gas uh, from Russia to Europe, will that risk backing Putin into a corner? I mean, what have you got left to do to Russia once you drop that boom on them? Well, look, this is one of the reasons, you know, why there's uh, what, what appears to be, you know, obviously from the Ukrainian uh, point of view, an acceptable hesitancy. But there is, you know, trying to kind of uh, form here and, you know, kind of be in the light of, you know, your article as well, some kind of incentivization and, and also to leave, you know, other things in your arsenal. But then there's the, also the point that this isn't all that easy to do quickly. I mean, yes, the United States can make some decisions about purchases of oil on the international market. You know, as I already alluded to, China may, you know, try to kind of pick up on this, but it depends. Uh, you know, we've been running around also trying to uh, talk to the Venezuelans and the Iranians. This could be a great time for other pariah states <laughs> to come back online and, you know, kind of basically... Saudi take Arabia! Another, like another approach Forget here. Khashoggi! Well, Forget well, him! There is an awful lot of questions about the OPEC Plus, uh, you know, group not trying not to, you know, uh, basically cash in on this and uh, increase supply. But look, on the gas front, it's going to be quite difficult for Europeans to make a quick move. This is something that they're going to, we've been telling them forever. I mean, I know I've been telling them forever and many others have, you know, Nord Stream 2 was preceded by Nord Stream 1. And we were opposed to that when I was NIO <laughs> during the Bush administration. And uh, Boyd and Gray was running around all over the place trying to, you know, basically get the Europeans not to move in that front. So, you know, we've goes back to the Soviet period. We didn't want the pipelines, you know, that run across Belarus and Ukraine uh, to Europe. So it's going to take some time to move away from this, particularly in countries like Germany and Poland and Hungary, you know, where Viktor Orban just went out to um, uh, meet with Putin on the eve of the war to sign another deal for cheap gas. It's going to be a real problem for them to move away. But I think, you know, the impetus has now come and it's going to take, you know, a couple of years to really kind of affect this. And of course, then we've got... Um, the big energy meetings in Houston this week, as well as you know, Congress deliberating this, it's going to really take also our private sector uh, to figure out how to manage it. So we've got the impetus, you know, finally to start to think about this. There's obviously the climate change uh, calculations that we've got to make, but it's not going to be something we can do in matters of days and weeks and months. This is going to be a much longer term effort here. Last question to end on an upbeat note, and I'll start with Jim since he spent time with him virtually. Jim, how big a factor has Zelensky's heart and soul and his mastery of social media and his character been in um, the um, progress of Ukrainian resistance and world resistance to this investigation? Great, great it, it, question. Invasion. Yeah, no, great question, Norman. I'll, I'll tell you, I'm a, I'm a skeptic of the sort of great man theory of history, you know, but there are exceptions and this is this is one of them. I, I really believe, and again, I had a little personal experience watching him and the call with the Congress uh, this weekend. Um, you know, here's a guy who hasn't slept presumably in 10 days he was concise. He was clear. He was passionate. He struck emotional tones. He was careful. He said, I'd like a no-fly zone because he has to say that, but I understand the issues. Um, that's a lot more reasonable, by the way, than some of my constituents. Um, and then his asks were very, very clear. And, you know, it's impossible to know for sure, but we started this conversation with just the remarkable instant unity of the West. Um, I think that the fact that Zelensky stayed and dominated the information space, which he did, that's the subject of a whole other conversation, uh, and that he did it in a media friendly way, you know, the quote of send me ammunition, I don't need a ride. I mean, that's Churchillian for the 21st century. I really believe his behavior and his demeanor and the way he has played this had a very material uh, effect on the remarkable stepping up of, 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 of everybody else. You know, remember, it wasn't that long ago, it was last summer that after telling President Biden 
that he would be that he would fight to the death president ghani of afghanistan was the first out the door now the situations are in no way similar but this is that you know people's thinking about zelensky was colored by the experience with ghani in afghanistan and when he sort of you know, almost in a script written by Hollywood did the exact opposite. It was a huge factor in uniting uh, the rest of the world. I not only believe in the great man theory of history, I believe in the great woman theory of history. Thank and you. Thank you. I realized I was in a lot of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, those of us who've had the pleasure of knowing and working with Fiona for so long, it was no surprise when the country and the world, the Intelligence Committee, Jim, saw that the our friend uh, exactly speaking out against... Um, Trump's behavior towards Zelensky, the, exactly the same as sitting in the Brookings cafeteria with her. Uh, so that is uh, the Fiona Hill we know and love. And I'm so glad our big tent friends, since Jim and I are repeat offenders, that our big tent friends have gotten to know her. I'm going to give Fiona the last word, and then Sue and I are going to talk about this, because we're working quite hard on it, actually, and did a call with Ukrainian civil society day today because of the power of the big tent. Fiona, what is the best things that thing that Americans who care about this can do to help? Well, you know what? That actually fits right into what we've just been talking about about the great man, you know, um, theory. Leadership really does matter. Um, I'm, Putin has made this decision. By the way, couldn't be a stronger contrast than Zelensky. Um, you know, if, if, if Putin hadn't been, you know, sitting where he is and made this decision, we wouldn't be, you know, all here today. But what Putin has miscalculated about what Zelensky understands, because Zelensky's 44, he's a totally different generation from a kind of horizontal networked society, is that people have power and people have agency. And he's giving a voice to all of the people around him. And that's what we can do, you know, back here in the United States as well. We can give voice to the unacceptability of this and we can also take action. I mean, I'm wearing a little pin here that I was in my coffee shop um, just the other morning and there's this big basket <laughs> of pins. And I said, oh, what's this? And, you know, my coffee shop is selling pins for Ukraine. I've got a sunflower in, you know, the Ukrainian uh, colours. And they're basically collecting all the money and, you know, basically sending them to the Ukrainian relief organisations. There are people who are out there are buying Airbnb rooms for Ukrainian refugees to stay in. There are uh, people... I mean, I've been on the phone all day with friends of mine from the northeast of England in the UK who've been driving all the way across Europe taking medical supplies and others who've been organising mobile hospitals using their networks from university and college and professional networks to get this uh, organised. So, I mean, basically, Putin didn't didn't think about any of this because he doesn't believe it happens. He believes the CIA always intervenes. He doesn't believe that there are networks of people and organisations schools you know that can organize you know everything from you know bake sales and you know kids um you know getting together to put supplies and, and care packages together we we can organize a major effort i mean I, you've got you know, all of your legal um background you know to try to help uh, ukrainians you know get legal assistance you know from the country at the top level to prosecute war crimes you know to people at the at the bottom who may need some assistance and you know trying to kind of press for um some kind of legal redress you know when it comes down the line about property um we can put pressure you know right to contact our congressman you know to ask about visa <laughs> liberalization and uh, you know where sorry jim you know to ways in which we can you know kind of get um, our congress to pass <laughs> legislation to sort of facilitate you know people to be able to get an assistance so i think that you know we have all of us individual agency and collectively a lot of power a lot of people power and that's what zelensky understood and what putin doesn't understand and that's why just why zelensky might prevail and Putin might not. I say might because there's always, you know, some horrible brutality, you know, that you can whip out as an authoritarian leader. But Zelensky has mobilized not just his own people, but given us all a boost, you know, to go out there and try to help him. We couldn't ask for a better uh, conclusion than that. I want to thank Jim. I want to thank Fiona. I want to thank everyone in the Big Tent. Uh, as your uh, pro bono uh, 
Council and Democracy Advisor Sue and I were working, including talking to Ukrainian civil society today, to the Ukrainians themselves. What do they feel that they need? We're going to come back to you. Fiona had such brilliant ideas. We're going to come back to you, your big tent colleagues. Uh, we'll come back to you with a list of by email of some of the best things that can be done so that every one of us can um, uh, uh, live up to uh, the uh, uh, hope and make the hope that Fiona articulates a reality uh, that uh, right will triumph over might in this terrible invasion. Um, I want to thank everyone. And with that, pass it back to Sue. Well, thank you to the three of you. This was really unbelievable. I wish we could do this every night. I feel like we would all really understand what's going on in the world. Um, Norm and Jim, thank you for coming back for the whatever number of time. And Fiona, we hope you'll come back and visit us again sometime soon. Um, and thank you everyone for being here tonight. We hope to see you at our next events. As a reminder, March 16th at 7 p.m., Daniel Squadron from Future Now, and April 5th at noon, me, Vecino. Have a great evening. <laughs>